The episode of Right Back Radio in which you are about to hear was originally aired on March 23, 2014. It was recorded in front of a live audience at a local bookstore in St. Louis. It was our first part two episode, and it wasn't planned. We didn't expect to go past the one hour increment that we gave ourselves when we recorded the first part. But you have to understand something. The writing industry has been changing rapidly over the last couple of decades, ever since the invention of the internet. A few years ago, you would be either traditionally published or, yeah, yeah good luck being self-published. Uh, you wouldn't make much. Then the internet took over and Amazon came out and self-published became a quite viable option for independent authors. But back then you could not become what was now known as a hybrid author. You either went down one path or the other until the industry changed again. You see, the traditional publishers had gone through many recessions and in 2008's recession they shrunk from the big eight to the big five. As a result, authors started being able to become hybrid authors. Traditional authors started looking at being able to self-publish, and the industry itself, the traditional publishers, started looking at the indies and going, hmm, maybe, maybe we can help them publish their works more and get more of our own audience growing. That's being polite about it. But this is part two of the episode known as Traditional versus Self versus Hybrid Publishing. Thank you for listening. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome to Right Pack Radio. This is David Allen Lucas, your host, and we are continuing today with a conversation we started two weeks ago on traditional publishing versus self-publishing versus hybrid publishing. I personally write mysteries, horror, and poetry, and with me today is... Jennifer Stolzer. I'm an author and illustrator. I specialize in YA and children as well. I'm Peter Green. I write uh, biography with social history and uh, military history and Patrick McKenna Mysteries. I'm T.W. Finley. I'm the author of Zero Time Historical Fantasy. And I've also got an audio book out named Jaguar Hope. I'm Fedora Amos. I'm president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. I write humorous Victorian whodunits starring Jemima McBussell. <laughs> and of course, sometimes I get a very strange obsession, a feeling that I absolutely must write something experimental, something strange, something modern. I usually sit down and wait until that feeling goes away. <laughs> However, sometimes I actually have to act upon it. And so I write short stories, but then, of course, I have nothing whatsoever to do with the short stories. So I send them to contests like the St. Louis Writers Guild contest, where I'm very proud to say that I was able to read my story at their winner's short story night last mm -hmm. Tuesday amidst the rumbling of freight trains going by. <laughs> you know, before I let the next person um, announce themselves, I'm just going to blame that on your muse, Suetonius. <laughs> and if you, and the readers, if you, or listeners, if you don't know what we're talking about, go back to our first episode on the muse. And you will hear all about the muse, Suetonius. I'm Melanie Colaney. I write nonfiction and uh, sci-fi and fantasy. I'm Matt McGraw. I'm an amateur writer. I do short stories mostly. And uh, I'm working on a book called Patrick the Spider, which is not for children, <laughs> with uh, my cousin Jennifer. It's for children, just particular children. <laughs> <laughs> Adult children. Yeah, parental guidance advice. Children, children who have refused to grow up. There we go. Yes, I'm Brad R. Cook. Uh, I'm president of St. Louis Writers Guild, and congratulations to Fedora. You did a great oh, job thank reading. You. Uh, I'm also a publisher of Blank Slate Press, and we are currently open to submissions. And I am a writer of historical fantasy, and my uh, 
first novel will be out later this year. Yay! <laughs> okay, and that actually really is a big thing. I don't want my sarcasm to sound because <laughs> it wasn't meant to be sarcastic. Quite all right. Sincere congratulations. It was Brad. sincere congratulations. I'm all of this. Yes, very sincere congratulations. <laughs> two weeks. As two they weeks. stare at me ominously. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks ago, we started talking about the debate that's always been in existence for a long time. Anyway, they got refanned by Donald Mayus and. Help me out. Joseph Conrad. Thank you, Hugh Joseph Alley. Conrad. And Hugh Alley. Digital Book World. Right. The, and Watch the others. debate was self-publishing versus traditional publishing. And I'm throwing in the hybrid publishing as another avenue of this in discussion. But we're going to get away from the actual debate itself today and go into how we were ending the last episode, which was a whole discussion on what are we marketing as, as writers, either traditionally published, self-published, should is there a difference in the focus of that marketing, and in the person in the writer's business plan, and I will turn it over from there. Well, it's funny you should mention this. Uh, I'm actually currently in the process of creating a marketing packet for blank slate press authors and stuff. And I actually start off with a tenant of there are two ways to market your book. One is for author. One is to market the author, the person who wrote the book, and the other is to market obviously the book, the story itself. Uh, we touched on that last time. There's a bunch of different ways you can do both. There are different ideas for doing both. But to be honest, I honestly think in this point, in this day and age, you kind of need to be doing both, uh, marketing both yourself and the novel. Uh, both reach different audiences. But, uh, well, I think it's it's mostly based on like what you've done before, though, I think. Because there's a natural tendency in uh, any business, especially these days, to uh, turn towards branding as a way to sell books or sell whatever it is you're selling yes. to people. And authors are brands. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, if you're like Stephen King, you know, you can just... They put the, his name bigger than the title yes. on the book. Mm -hmm. Right. But then because, again, if well, Stephen King it. wanted to write something completely non-horror, then maybe he'd want to write under a pseudonym. Well, and that, that's a good, good point. There, I was having a discussion with some very well-published authors the other day, and one being a New York Times bestseller about most of the people sitting at this table know. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about a woman, I think it was a woman author, who actually made it big. She was writing a paranormal romance. Made it big is in, she was selling really well in the in the mid-list, and one of the big houses picked her up and wanted her to write a tr trilogy. Well, she wrote the first book, and it was fun for her. But when she started writing the second book, she discovered this is not what she wanted to write. Hmm. So she had already branded herself, into this pigeonhole, if you will, mm. of genre. And then she had to try and find a way back out of it two books later to be able to get back to writing what she wanted to. And that was a tough go. So here's a question. Write the trilogy and move on. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, yeah, it was, according to the story that I was being told, the first book didn't require that much rewriting. The next two took a lot more because our heart wasn't into it. Yeah. So let me ask this question of the group. As I believe a lot of our listeners are not the big name authors, but either the mm. mid list or those who are really just trying to break in. Do you put, do you advertise yourself before you have a book out there? And if so, how do you want to, what kind of branding do you want to do or do you want to avoid branding? I think absolutely you have to get yourself out there as soon as you decide to become a writer, period, create a uh, website for yourself. And it's not that hard to do. There are lots of ways that you can do it practically for free, if not for free, even though those come with a bunch of ads and other things that are not that attractive. And certainly anybody can get on Blogspot, and you can do all kinds of social media and create an audience for your product before you even have a product, and I think you have to. I think that's where I'm at a lot of times. You know, I'm not, I've gotten a few things published. I'm still in that stage, and one thing I would say would Fedora just says is correct from my opinion, but be careful of one thing. Don't become a professional social networker if your goal is to be a professional writer. Mm -hmm. Keep it in balance. Yeah. Well, it's hard you to have do. to have product. To well, and, yeah, and that's it. Until yeah. you have a product, I mean, you're selling yourself so far, but at some point you're now losing business because you're attracting people in and you have nothing to offer them. Oh, like However, it angle. is important... To start off ahead of time. I mean, they say at least six months you should, but I say as soon as you yeah, can soon, before the book yeah. comes out. Um, Brad, to begin to answer your question from my point of view, uh, at least what I've learned so far is 
that if you're writing nonfiction, it helps to market the author and his qualification to write the nonfiction. In the case of my World War II biography, I had 400 letters from my dad that my mother saved from World War II, and uh, that helped tremendously, and I think it adds to my credibility. In, uh, in my fiction, I, I market the books, but also a little bit myself because I am, I'm a, an architect, and I write architectural mysteries. So uh, in that case, I, I talk about all the skullduggery and things that an architect uh, or that works with engineers runs across <laughs> in the hidden infrastructure. You know, 70% or 90% of our city is hidden underground, and, and that's where the people that are in charge of all that money and all that construction can do a world of, uh, of uh, crazy deeds. I think that's a very good point. What you're talking about there is the equivalent of a hook in a book. You need to start off with something that will grab interest, at least interest in a niche market of some description. And what you're talking about there is creating a platform, a group of people who is interested in whatever you have to say. Yeah. And that is the basis of a street team, if nothing else. Exactly. Um, and it's my opinion that there are, there are two tiers You'll always sell books to your friends and family because they love you. And they should be buying your books because they have to express their love for you somehow. But the marketing yourself is kind of making a wider circle of friends and family. They buy it because they love you. Uh, when you have a book itself, there are plenty of people out there that don't care who you are and never will. That's when you need to start marketing what the book is about and what genre it's in and the tone, and try and hook the people that are looking for something to read, not necessarily someone to read. Right, and what's different and special and unique about that book mm -hmm. that makes it better or more interesting than all the others. And if you're lucky, that group of fans will then jump into your friend group after they read your book because they enjoy your sense of humor, your voice, your interests, and then they'll become the friend and family group and are interested in your personal advertisement. So I guess my opinion is do both. While you don't have a book, focus on you. And when you do have a book, focus on that with also not forgetting you. Uh, well, you what? definitely don't want to forget yourself because one thing, a lot of the really successful writers are the ones that still reach out to the fans mm -hmm. and will respond mm -hmm. to the fans. They don't hire, well, I'm going to sit here and hire Brad to answer all my emails and post on my Facebook. That, I will. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll talk price later. Be, but no, on the serious the side, <laughs> yeah, on the serious side, Fans really want to hear from the author themselves, yes. or and hear if they write an email, they want an author it's email back. Interacting with your reader, yes. and it's really important to maintaining yourself as a writer throughout your career because these people. I mean, to be honest, your core readership should really be a group of friends, mm -hmm. and I don't mean that as in your personal friends. <laughs> I mean that as in the people who are your biggest, you know, fans, the people who are going to read every single one of your books. You know, you want to build a connection with them. Uh, there are plenty of writers who have, you know, some really amazing fan bases. And for any of you who don't know it, I'm going to call out Heather Brewer and her minions. Um, I mean, it is an amazing group of fans, and they're virulent, and they, they love her, and she loves them right back. And, and, and they get her books everywhere. They get her books everywhere. Spread and the gospel. that's going yeah. to happen. I mean, mm -hmm. people who voraciously love you are going to tell everyone they know about you. And, and that's why, you know, but to be honest, and, you know, as we were saying earlier about the difference between marketing a book and marketing the author. Um, the story can reach a huge number of people. You can reach a huge number of people. Those aren't necessarily going to be the same people. Mm -hmm. oh. And and that's why, you you know, the whole point of marketing is to find as many different avenues you can to reach out to different people. Because you already have a core group that you know. Your book has a core group that it's going to read. But guess what? There's probably a sub-theme in your book that might attract another core group of people. And if you can pull those people in, that's more book sales. And the more people you can pull into a broadening universe of either yourself and what you do or the story and how many different roads it takes, that's marketing. Melanie, you had a question? Well, I was just thinking it, this gets complicated when you write very different types of books. Charlene Harris has mm -hmm. written, okay, there's commonalities, but there's differences in the types of series she wrote. She wrote right. them at different points in her time. Mm -hmm. But let's say she was writing 
I'm just thinking of two of her series. The one she's most famous for is the Suki Stackhouse series. Mm-hmm. Always but, knows True Blood, right? Yeah. yeah. But before that, she wrote... Mystery series. I don't know. Yeah, Southern Mystery Series. Mm-hmm. One of the them... The Librarian. No, uh, that was the other one. No, that was Aurora Tea Garden. Garden. Oh, I forget yeah. the name of that one. But That's she also yeah, wrote another one idea. with Shakespeare in all the titles. Mm. But anyway, those all three of those, they were all mysteries. But they were very different types of mysteries. And mm-hmm. there were some commonalities. But frankly, if you write, like the True Blood, you wouldn't necessarily like the Aurora That's Tea true. Garden. And vice versa mm-hmm. is definitely true. My mom loves mm-hmm. the Aurora Tea Garden ones, but she wouldn't like True Blood. So marketing that all yeah, but would you're be... not trying to market the same like you're trying to market a book to a person. Right. Not but, my entire collection but to a person. Actually this is I'd love to market my entire collection to a person, but I can't guarantee they're gonna love every book I've ever written. But the But they're gonna yeah. love that book. Oh. And then there are other people who are gonna love this book. And guess what? Now you've got two people who love you. You know, and you've got two different groups. The problem with that is, for instance, I have found True Blood books mm-hmm. in the mystery section right next to the Aurora Tea Garden books oh, yeah, in the yeah, library. Yeah. And it really disturbs certain people, not of my age group, that they pick up a book that they think it's a lighthearted mystery and it turns out to be horror, paranormal horror. Yeah. Well, and But, I mean, that's also about where the books are going to be in a bookstore because they're all labeled yeah. by author. Right. You know? And a yeah. lot of people will change the name. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can have a pseudonym for your different ones. But to be honest, you know, there's nothing wrong with having different genres laid out that you're kind of passing back and forth on. It's something you can totally do. You just have to realize that maybe you're not going to carry every audience over, but you're yeah. going to carry some. May I say something? Tell you a little story. This is about how old marketing plans really don't work very well. <laughs> and so today, the advice is to go to as many different ways as you possibly can. Old time Harlequin, which was one of the big paperback publishers, mm-hmm. I have a friend who writes for Harlequin Historicals. Five years ago, she was debuted in a package. I don't know if you know what a package mm-hmm. is, but basically it's that uh, it's pre-sold stuff like teacups or whatever that are sent to Costco and to Walmart. Yeah. And they don't care what the books are any more than they care what the napkins look like. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's just products to them. They put them on the shelves and in four or six weeks later, they rip off the covers of those that aren't sold, destroy the rest of it, send the covers back. And that's their model. Her packaging sales for the first book were 9,000 plus copies. Unknown, 9,000 plus copies is not too bad. Mm -hmm. She's still in that same program. The most recent one was less than 5,000. It's showing you pretty clearly that that is a model that no longer works. It's a marketing model that does not work. They have to find others at the big publishing houses, and we have kind of a jump on them because we don't have that background to start with. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's interesting that you mentioned the old style, one and one of the things we talked about, I think Fedora just said, is you got to market yourself every way, every way you can in modern day. But I've got a caveat to that, and let me ask this question on that marketing, that merchandise processing. On the merchandise that went out there, was there any way, looking at that merchandise, looking at that teacup, that they could go right back to the author's webpage? Like it had a website on it or What, anything. on the book? On the book, on the napkins, on whatever. That was metaphorical. <laughs> metaphorical. Yes. No, but I'm just saying, I understand that was metaphorical. Well, if we're going to get into, you know, But if we're going to get into Star Wars <laughs> swag and Star Wars merchandise. But what I was going to go with, what I'm trying to say is, everything you do as a writer, you if you're going to comment on someone's blog, if you're going to post a blog, if you are going to comment on even a CNN article out there as an expert in something, you want to be able to tie your comment right back to your web page. Oh, absolutely. Sign yeah. every email with it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Sign every absolutely. email with it. Kiosly give it out. Have, book, have business cards with it and so forth. Sliding also, if you are a non-fiction writer and you are doing some type of presentation somewhere, like... Peter, let's say he's doing a presentation on World War II. People are going to want his book because they want to take a piece of him home with them if they really enjoyed his talk and his wife really does not want to release him <laughs> physically. <laughs> they, they really do want to take a book. So if you are doing nonfiction, have a book. If you are writing fiction, get yourself at, into panels at conventions and have a book. Because once again, if you've never gone to a convention where as writers... You're in for a treat. You go. They usually will talk a lot about the industry. But, again, the audience wants to take home something of that person. And if you don't have any books, if you don't get the books distributed there, 
you're losing out on a chance for a sale. Even if you are an unknown, when you go in, somebody just discovered you, and now you have that chance. And in the process of all our talking, Kathleen, Yay. my co-host, has been here. Kathleen, <laughs> nice of you to show up. So, quick oh, introduction, thanks. Kathleen. <laughs> Um, my name is Kathleen Cayende. I write under the pen name Kaseka and Vita. Um, GLBT romance, paranormal fun stuff, urban fantasy. Yeah, that's me. Kaseka mm-hmm. cool. and Vita. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on with that. What so were we talking about? We were <laughs> <laughs> going to jump into Excellent. something. We were talking a little bit about the previous kinds of marketing where you mm-hmm. would do some packaging and get, get your books into stores, which was really successful for a long time. And a lot of things are changing now. And one of the things that I... I have really liked the best, uh, you know, both as um, starting out with a small press and now I'm into becoming a hybrid author because I've got my book out um, through CreateSpace now, so it's independent. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the biggest things for me has been Goodreads and, you know, things like Goodreads and uh, library, uh, what is it called, library journal, whatever it's called. Anyway, Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's about a half a dozen of different sites, but Goodreads is the biggest one. It has millions of readers. And this is a way where you can kind of get to the people who really do like the kind of book that you write and they can sign up to follow your blog. And not only that, but I mean, they, they do interviews with authors every once in a while. And so you can actually sit down and have an interview with one of the big time authors that you like as well. So it, it's kind of exciting that we have this capability to do this kind of things now. Yes, ask this question. Brad, you're, you're a traditional publisher and you talked a little while ago about going out and having these, um, platforms or these packages for writers to to advertise them as traditional publisher you basically you probably get them to go to various events and the writer has to push themselves and you put them in a catalog self-publishers or independent publishers i should say they usually have to do all this on their own right. but is there outside of the catalog which a lot of times not always, but a lot of times the independent publishers can't get into. And the catalog for my for our listeners are is a catalog that gets sent to the big name bookstores, your libraries, and so forth. It lists, hey, we're a publisher, and here's all the books we've got coming out. And quick, brief descriptions of those books, I take it. Yes. So the question is, is there a difference in how to market between the two? Because... I don't want to bring up the whole entire argument between Donald Mays and the self-publishers, but the thrust of that was, well, the traditional publishing is broken, self is better, no, traditional is better, we do all this other stuff for you. But when we pull aside the opinions, when we pull aside the money, which is huge, on both sides for advertising, the process of that advertising, is there any difference? Okay, there is a difference. Uh, It comes on many levels. Uh, and on some of them, I would say there's less of a difference than you'd think. Um, so the first is money. Um, your big traditional publishers on your biggest books, and these are the big guys that everyone's going to read. I mean, they literally have fifty to a hundred thousand dollar marketing budget. That's the marketing budget. That's None of us yeah. could ever hope <laughs> to to do that. And and I myself at Blank Slate Press have nowhere near that mm. kind of a marketing budget. I'd love one, but no. Um, so maybe someday. Uh, yes, yeah, someday that'd be nice. Um, but the the kicker is, so you have the catalog, and the catalog is probably the biggest one. As David was saying, that catalog gets you in front of the biggest buyers. Um, every distributor puts out a catalog. Um, so and it's your distributor really who's doing the catalog, and so they're you know the buyers are really going to just a couple of distributors distributors going through all their catalogs and that's what they choose. There are ways for self-pubbers to get into that. Um, you can go through Ingram and stuff like that if you can get distribution through or listed through various ways through Ingram. Um, but the point is, is then you're going towards the back of the catalog. Does that matter if it's a good book with good sales? No. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the kicker. If it's a good book with good sales, it's going to help sell. Um, it's really still up to the author to really push a book. Um, the kicker is with a publishing house uh, is that not only are you pushing yourself, but then you have somebody else pushing you. And they're not just pushing you. They're pushing you and everyone else who's an author within their house. Um, and then most of those authors are then pushing everyone within their house. So you've already got a built-in network. That network goes out to others. Can you build your own network? Of course. Um, you know, and that's the point of self-publishing. You can do a lot of this work yourself and probably should be doing a lot of this work. Um, the kicker is, is, is there anyone else doing some of that work for you? Um, and 
For most solvers, no, but that's not bad. I mean, to be honest, in this day and age, you're only going to get so much help from any publisher you go with. Um, they're doing a lot. You know, publishing houses do, you know, they'll hold events. They'll maybe arrange some signings for you, maybe help you get some signings. More importantly, maybe they're going to pack in three or four of their authors to a signing. You know, agencies do this too if you're with an agency. Uh, agencies will often arrange an event that, that has all their, you know, the agent's clients there. Um, so, and, you know, an event with three or four writers is probably going to bring more people to it than an event with one writer. But, you know, it really is about sales. It really is about your push. It really is about your online presence, as we were talking before. You know, that that's really the core of everything. And that's all marketing, so. Seems to me like, uh, for the individual author, like, it would be nice if you could get into the, uh, the publishing house just because it's, like, extra stuff but no real cost, it doesn't seem no. like. No. Well, the cost is all, I mean... Of course, there's cost, and it, every publisher Royalty puts for his cost. But the kick is, you don't, you're not fronting that cost. So that cost is probably going to come out of your royalties a bit. It's also going to come out of, you know, not all of it. I mean, you know, some of it's about the sales and what the publisher makes. But yeah, none of that cost is to you. Right. And if you're with an even bigger house, then you got your in advance. And it's until you make out that advance, and then you'll start making more money on it. But if you don't get in there, like, as the individual author, it's like, well, either your choices are you go a self-route or you give up. Yeah. Well, there are the smaller presses, which are very important these days. Uh, and that's still traditional publishing. I mean... It is. Blank Slate Press is nowhere near, like, any of the big boys, but in terms of how we're structured... There's no difference. But in a sense, you're a little more accessible than, oh, yeah, yeah. than Simon & Schuster. Oh, yeah. Well, and I'm you're, more you're willing, willing to take to... risk on certain books than Simon & Schuster is because I don't That's care if I a need. book... You know, if a book doesn't necessarily sell as well as all the other books on my list, I'm okay with that. Because I, I if I'm putting out your book, it's a really good book. And I'm mm -hmm. 100% behind it. And I really think it's a great book. So I want to see it in print form. But if it doesn't sell as well as the other, like, ten titles I have, I'm kind of okay with that. Now, Simon & Schuster, or one of the big guys, they're going to be a lot less okay if that book does not make money. Because that's a huge part of their planned out budget. They can't devote more money, and they may not pick up your next book. Mm -hmm. Because you didn't sell as well as the other, you know, people they had going that year. So there, there's a difference on that level of, you know, because they're playing with a lot more money and a lot more risk. Uh, you know, that to be honest, there there's a lot more at stake. And with that, in a big, big house. I'll let Jeff in here because I know you want to say it, say yeah. something, but I'm just going to, to underline what one thing Brad's saying. To the big houses, if you sell 100,000 books, you're doing good. If you sell, say, 20,000 20, books, not as good, and may not pick up the next one. If you are at a small press and you sell 20,000 books, that's similar in yeah. success. To the 100,000 books I mentioned a moment ago. Go ahead, Jen. Well, I just wanted to... I'd be flipping cartwheels. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted Up and to... down the street. No, I'd like to see that. I want video. <laughs> yeah. well, no, no, no. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to note that it's as important for someone who's being published through Simon & Schuster to run all their own marketing. It is. Because the way we're talking, it sounds like if we, you get published by one of the big guys, that they're going to take your hand and help you, which for a small amount they are. They're going to get you in places that you otherwise couldn't get, mm -hmm. but they're not going to give you a publicist, and they're not going to yeah. to help you, you know. Well, you're more run, likely yeah. to get that at a big house, but you're right. Even at the big house, until you make it big, you're only going to get maybe $10,000 chucked at your book instead of $150,000 chucked at your book. And if you oh. get a publicist, it's only going to be for a very short yeah, duration, yeah. not a long term. Yeah, I was under the impression, just from what research I've done and, <clears throat> and lectures no, I've no. attended, that it's uh, they they talk a big game... But there is some validity to doing it yourself. Oh, yeah, no, no, you Because you're going to do just as much work when you get published by a big author and then you'll have, or a big publisher, and then you'll have even more work on top of that See, because you have to maintain those contracts. The kicker is, is that a publisher is not a publicist. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the kicker. A publisher is there really to make certain you have the best possible product that can be made. Because that's the most important thing, is that that book is perfect, it's got a beautiful cover, it's got all the right stuff that it's supposed to have. You know, it, that's a publisher's job. I, for no other stuff, that's what a publisher does. Now, the publicity is part of that and gets folded in, but to be truthful and honest, a publisher is not a publicist. Mm -hmm. and, 
the author is the publicist. Mm -hmm. And has that always been the case? No. Is that the case now? Yes. And it's very much the case. But that's the way, you know, that's almost better. Because who's better at, you know, pushing your book than the person who loves it most? Now, a lot of ideas should be generated and other stuff like that that Mm -hmm. other people can help you with. You know, is it a lot of work? Heck yeah. But, you know, to be honest, the publishing, the publisher is about the book. And you are about your marketing. Bringing it back to the, the debate between sell yourself or sell your book, would you say going through a traditional publisher leans more toward the sell your book side, or are they going to deal with selling yourself if they're if you're not Tom Clancy? Okay, in terms of uh, in terms of the big five, mm-hmm. what you're really going to see most is that they sell the the story, they mm-hmm. sell the book. Now they do that until the author becomes so big that that is nece- not necessarily the case anymore. If you look at somebody like James Patterson. Mm-hmm. I, I don't really, I can't tell you what his next five books are going to be that are coming out next month or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, um, but my you know, grandfather will buy them. Yes, a lot of people are going to buy them, and they're going to buy them because it says James Patterson. As you were saying, you know, Stephen King's name is bigger than the title of his books yeah. and some of his things. And they do that because that's branding the author. But, you know, in terms of some of the other books that you'll read, you know, uh, the Harry Potter series is hard to say that with because J.K. Rowling's super huge but Mm -hmm. you know the book is really what got pushed and you know in terms of divergent divergent as an example it's breaking really big on the world right now because it's got a movie coming out exactly but it existed before the movie yes Mm -hmm. and it was being pushed for its genre and its story more so than its author it's feeding off of uh hunger games hunger games Games, twilight branding Uh, mortal instruments all that yeah. kind of thing. Of course, that's but, all the same genre. They're actually reasonably different books. I mean, they all have they female have protagonists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, the but, point is, is that it's not that they're the same book. The point right. is that you know they're running a similar theme, and more importantly, and Hitting this a is similar demographic. This, this yeah. is hard to say in front of a table like this because we're all authors and we love books. But <laughs> the majority of people probably could not name the five or six authors of yeah. the books that we have just named. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they can name the book Divergent. Everyone loves Divergent, but do they know who wrote it? Not necessarily. And, however, with Stephen King novels, that's, you know, I don't even necessarily know the titles of all the Stephen King books because I'm like, I know the story and I know it's Stephen King. I'd like to say something. Mm. That is, (laughs) I I think there are a lot of independent writers out there who are doing something right. Mm -hmm. Now, I know a lot of people don't think Hugh Halley's Numbers really add up to much or to make a lot of sense. But this is what he said about the 7,000 bestsellers in Amazon's most popular fiction genres. That was mystery, thriller, sci-fi, fantasy, and romance. And his results for that one particular day, which he may have cherry-picked, I certainly think he might have, (laughs) showed 35% of the titles were self-published and another 18% were by a single author with no publisher listed. And uh, check my edition here, that's 45, 53%, more than half of the top 7,000 bestsellers at Amazon Is were not from the big house. That's all ebooks. Those, those well, are all ebooks. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. okay I, I think the way he gets that... Is I suspect no, no, well, the real first quick, thousand if you, if you want, make up most of the sales. No, no, no. If you want to check it out, um, uh, Digital Book World put out their response to Hugh Howie's numbers, uh, questioning them and saying why they questioned them. So yeah. you can read the Digital Book World blog. David had a, a link in the last one about those numbers. Uh, are they true? It, it doesn't matter. Almost in a sense, um, what it really represents, though, is that. And what Howie's numbers show is that, yet again, of self-publishing, the people who make the superstar ranks, and this is true for traditional publishing, and this is true for self-publishing, the people who make the superstar money, the people who make the best, represent the smallest chunk of the industry. You know, the, the people who sit on every bookshelf in every Barnes & Noble, they represent 1% or so of all the writers. The 1%! You know, <laughs> Hugh Howie, yeah. Joseph Conrad, and the other, you know, Amanda Hawking... And some of the other self-pubbers who've sold over a million books and everything, they represent 1% of self-publishing. Mm-hmm. So when you, it does, it almost doesn't matter the rules. It doesn't matter the, the money. It doesn't matter the numbers. When you come down to it, the top successful, most successful people in anything are still going to represent the smallest number of that industry. It doesn't matter. It's just, I don't know. Okay. So, um, I'm not sure if this has been covered yet, but it sounds like there's been a lot of marketing talk and um, mm-hmm. big publisher talk. And something that I had wanted to talk about um, when we previously had a conversation on self versus traditional publishing was how what we write and why we wrote it determine 
how we choose to publish it or if we choose to publish it. Um, because like there's Charles Delint, he's got an open pen name to publish books that uh, are not in his usual genre. They're darker than his usual fantasy, but you know, people know it's him. And he also sends out chapbooks every year to friends and family in lieu of a Christmas card. Mm-hmm. So that's publishing. And there's all kinds of other things that people do, like publishing stories online on their websites for free. Well, so you were, Fedora was just mentioning at the very beginning that uh, when she uh, wrote, writes a short story, it gets sent off to contests because yeah. you don't publish short stories. <laughs> Everything else to do with yeah. it. But for the writers that do, like, yeah. how do you even classify them? And should, should you bother? And well, I think you should definitely bother because you'll confuse your audience if you don't. Well, but, to her words, I mean, the the beauty of the of the time we live in exactly. is that you can publish anything, and you can publish it in so many different ways. That if you want to send a chat book out to all your friends and family at Christmas, which by the way is a great idea, I'm going to start stealing that. I totally <laughs> want to do that. Too. Um, but yeah, so if you want to do that, that's fine. But the expectation is that that chat book is going to go just to your friends and family. You know, it, it's not like you're expecting that chat book to then suddenly take off and become a New York Times bestseller. You know, and, and that's the ticket. So know exactly where you're going. Like we were talking the last time with uh, Peter's book. You know, Peter's got two very different books, uh, one of which, you know, went through a traditional house, uh, L&L Dreamspell, you know, your mystery, your Patrick McKenna mysteries. Right. And then also you have, you know, your memoir about your dad, right. which you tried to get into a bunch of different houses and it didn't work. But the point is, is that, you know, that's because a lot of people probably didn't want to take on, you know, a memoir or whatever, but... To be honest, that's a great book. I've read it, and it should have come Thank out. It, it deserved to come out, and the beauty is we live in a time when it can come out. You know, well, it did pub- come out once with yeah. an independent press, but no, that's now good I'm point. trying to go broader. Yes. Yeah. But then that's the beauty part, is that you have those options, and we're so filled with options in this day and age. Right. On a related note to those options, though, um, you chose to publish it with a small press, and there are people who will choose to publish with a smaller press, and then they'll go to a bigger one. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what influences your decision maybe to publish one story with a smaller press and not necessarily even look to bigger ones versus or, shopping something around the or, big houses? Let me, add to that, let me add a level to that question. And excuse me as I go into using a sports-related um, metaphor. What sports? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Anyway, but is... Being with the smaller press, being the proverbial playing in the in the minors. farm minors in the farm league, and then you're you're building up until you can go to the big league of five of five presses. Um, I was just reading something I mean, today I'm about oh, I'm what should to. you put in your yeah. query letter? Like if you are querying an agent or you're querying oh. a big publisher, should you put in there that you've been self-published? And their rule of thumb was only if you've been really successful. And they had some information there about how to gauge your success. You know, mm-hmm. if you had more than 5,000 books sold or, or whatever, that would be pretty much the yardstick you use. I'm grateful to take them at all. I know. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of how I'm feeling about it. It's like, I... I don't really have the luxury of deciding which and where, you know? It's kind of just whatever you can grab at a certain right. level. Right. And the other thing, to answer your question, Kathleen, is uh, time is a factor. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm. it took me 10 years to know what I now know, get two books out, and, and the third one would have been out, but the publisher died. So I Whoops. sort of had to start yeah. over with my mysteries. But... Uh, time now i have to decide whether i want to wait uh, a year or two through the vetting process of an agent if i should be so lucky to get one and and a, then the agent has to sell it to a, a publisher and and that could take two or three years before we ever see this book i could have that book out next month because it's all ready to go and and so frankly, you know, I'm not getting any younger here, so I'm thinking <laughs> maybe it makes sense to get it out there, see how many people I can get to like it, public, uh, you know, publicize the heck out of it, and and see where I can go with it. Time, time. I mean, that's and, and this is where Conrad and and Howery were right. I mm-hmm. mean, time is the big crux in in big publishing, traditional publishing. That's their problem yeah. because it does take at least a year for a book to come out. Sometimes two, depending upon at which point in the process your book gets put into the queue. Does mm-hmm. that mean ain't nobody got time for that? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, they're institutions, you know. They're well. It, there's a lot. Their nature is yeah. to be sort of solid. Nice, you two are high fiving over there. Uh, <laughs> you're sort of solid and slow and not easily like toppled. They're not going to take you know 
big uh, unnecessary risks, and that's why they're still around, is that they kind of play yeah. it safe and slow. Well, yeah, and they do it well. You know, their motto must be, we grind slow, but exceedingly <laughs> fine. <laughs> the kicker it's here, like no, the reason it takes long, no, here it is, crushes. the reason it takes long for about two years or whatever is because they're selling the book before it comes out. And for most self-pubbers and for most, you know, the way the new model is to sell the book once it comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, the old model has always been the book gets sold before it comes out. Mm -hmm. Walmart's already put in its order for hundreds of thousands of copies before that book ever hit the shelf. That's the way traditional publishing, the big five, really work. Offload the risk onto the local bookstores and all everyone else. Well, it's, it's, it's about knowing if it's a hit or not. If 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 Target wants it, Walmart wants it, Barnes & Noble wants it, you know you've got a mega hit. You've already sold a couple of hundred thousand copies. The book's already sold. The money's already made. You run it to the printer. Boom, it's done. It's, you know, but that took time. You got to get it in a catalog. You get it in front of those buyers. Those buyers have to make those decisions. You know, all of that is where that built-in amount of time comes from. Plus, then there's the working on the book and all that kind of stuff. But it really is all that selling ahead of time, you know, and, and that's the difference. Whereas for most, and you're right, a self publisher can have a book out in a couple of months and it's a great product and it's right and then they're going to push it everywhere they can. And and that's the difference. That's really that, that fundamental difference there. Is the book being sold before it comes out or is the book being sold once it's out? Let me ask this question of the group. Before we run out of time, I know we're getting close to the end, but we're not there yet. The owls. Not the owls. Yeah. Um, what? Pretending, pretending, for example, that I am brand new to this game, which I'm not, but pretend for a second, and I come up to you, any of you, and say, "What are the dangers of being self pub or being traditional pub? Are there dangers in it? Is there oh, yeah. people to be aware of? Is there landmines?" Oh, scammers. Editors. Yeah, okay, yeah. let's start off with the big one, and that is your vanity presses that are going to charge mm -hmm. you several thousand dollars straight up front to give you a book. And and check all of them on Predators and Editors because there are too many to list. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. There's and a then, site for that. And there, yeah. there yeah. are agents that demand fees for absolutely everything that yeah. they, you really shouldn't have to no. pay. No, you should never pay. The, the kicker is always you should never pay. You should always be paid. Now, in the self-pubbing model, that is, you should always hire, and you should never just, you know, you should have an invoice for that, not just hand over a bunch of money to somebody. Agreed. And um, stepping back for just a second, we said predators and editors. For the listener, if you don't know what that is, it is a website that lists predators that are in the publishing industry, agents, and so forth. And Predator is spelled P-R-E, then the word editor. Yeah, predatorsandeditors.com. Yep. Preded .com. Yeah, Preded.com. Preded.com. And Predator is actually spelled like editor, yeah, which is a Pred misspelling of yes. Predator. Uh -huh. Could we link but that on funny. our Facebook page? I'll or? say about that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to something that Peter said about time being a factor and how he chose to publish his, his book. I think that success, and, um, someone's idea of success, everyone's differs. So something that a person who absolutely wants to be in the spotlight thinks is terrible sales. Someone who just, you know, wanted their voice to be heard would be like pretty stoked. So um, I don't know that everybody is wanting to, as you said, David, go to small publishers to build up to bigger ones. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. there are a lot of factors in it. And I don't mm -hmm. know. I was talking to someone um, at a writing conference and uh, she wrote a book. It seemed pretty good. I didn't read the actual book, but it seemed mm -hmm. like it had a real good shot of actually getting published at least a uh, small press. Mm -hmm. She sent it. She didn't try and shop it to agents. She sent it directly to publishers, and she said she got a couple of offers from publishers and chose the better one. Now, I don't know if she sent it to vanity presses or actual legitimate small presses, mm -hmm. but either way, she was happy to have her book out. Mm -hmm. She didn't particularly want to get... She didn't care so much that it was the best place to publish it, that it was a place to publish it that got a, you know, the book out that she, she wanted, wanted out. an audience. She didn't want a specific audience type or an everyone in the world audience. She well, she didn't care about her. the everyone in the world, but I yeah. mean, I think she, she wanted to see her book in print. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And making money was probably secondary. I don't know if it cost her anything or not, but... Thank you for saying that. Oh yeah. my goodness. 
a lot of the marketing and public publication talk has been about money and I've been just kind of sitting here like, but I just want to write things. I think it's well, fun and it's great to put stuff out there. But if that takes away all of your writing time, go. The yes. kicker is your book should make back the investment. Otherwise, you, you, you're hurting yourself. Well, there's an emotional like, investment. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. If there's an emotional investment, you're in for that. that can, I would love that it. Can, I mean, and why to have you your write book in something, your hand. Yeah. Why would you write something unless you were enjoying it? At least at the beginning. How are you going to publish the next thing? Why do you want to publish anything? No, no, no. Okay. The next thing you write, how are you going to publish it? Do you want let, to publish let, it? Let me play IRS. The, thing. I'm, <laughs> look, the following is not coming from anybody who is an attorney or who is involved with the IRS. I have to say that because I am a paralegal. Um, <laughs> that way I don't get myself in jail for some of the stuff I could say. Um, but it all depends really, Kathleen, on what you're saying. Depends on what are you doing with your writing. Are you treating it like a business? In other words, you're taking taxes off from your income tax for various business expenses, or are you treating it like a hobby? There are plenty of people. Let me step out of publishing for a second. There are plenty of people who do crafts. It's a hobby for them, but they go to the craft shows and they sell their stuff. Do they take that off their taxes? Well, if it's a hobby, technically they shouldn't. And I said before, I'm not in the field that I can even give any advice to that. But if you are going into the writing as a business, then it turns around up to you and you've got to treat it like a business. If you're not doing it that way, then you can end up in a lot of trouble with yourself, your readership, if you have an agent or a publisher, and as well as with the big ugly people wearing gold shields to come up and knock on your door and say, we're going to do a tax audit. Not the fraud police then. Well, yeah, yeah. Nobody's going to show up on show up with a clipboard and say you're not a writer. If that's what you mean. Okay, I want to get into that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm guessing then we are talking about people who choose to write as a business, and not everybody writes full time. I don't know how people manage to only write and maintain maintain some kind of creative sense of fun and imagination, and you know, because I for me, if I was doing that. I would be thinking, oh, no, is this publishable? First sentence gone. No, no, can't do this. Is this publishable? Oh, no, I can't write this either. You just defined my life. <laughs> well, and actually, I don't want that to be the case. And before you get to your question, not only did you just define Jennifer's life, a lot of those, oh, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I, let me avoid that. Several writers, or several authors I've spoken to who have gotten that big signing, and now they've got three books that they have got to put out after their first one got accepted run exactly into that mental mindset of, oh, my God, oh, my God, am I able to really do this? And some of those are big-name um, New York Best Times bestsellers that have run into that question, and think, but they're pulling off a fraud. They're not a writer. They're not mm -hmm. at that level, but yet here they are. Okay, but psychological hang-ups aside, uh -huh. uh, what I have read and uh, comes up again and again by writers who've been around for a while and have a number of books is <clears throat> the more books you manage to put out there of good quality, they have to be of good quality, uh, the more likely you are to sell. Uh, I noticed when I put out my second book, there was a lot of interest in my first one. So the, I only have two to, uh, you know, that have been out there to compare, but, but they say you have three or four and suddenly it gets a lot more interesting. Your next book will always help sell. Every book books. you've ever written. Yeah, because if somebody new finds you, they go, oh, I wonder yeah. what else he's got in his backlog. And this is why series books do so well. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the third in the series will sell the first two. Well, mm -hmm. That's kind of my theory about trying to get my short stories out there. That's my project this year is to try to get, I've got a backlog of short stories. Mm -hmm. They run shorts on Kindle, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and audiobooks. And you can do audiobooks for free, uh, co cooperating with actresses and actors, yeah. which is fabulous. And Jaguar Hope is awesome, so yeah. totally get it. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm getting out all my short stories, a lot of which have won contests, because that's what I do with my short stories as well. And uh, so I'm trying to say, okay, this is the year I'm going to try to get as much stuff out as I can while I'm working on the next book. And um, then hopefully, you know, by the time that this next book comes out, I'll have enough stuff out there to where I can use that to leverage some interest in my new book. Because it is a tough go to try to find your audience. It's really hard. I mean, even with all the wonderful tools there are out there and all the great friends that you meet when you're networking, it's difficult to find your audience. However, That's short good. stories is a great way to compendium to your book. So if mm -hmm. they're short stories that relate back to your book or relate back to the genre, that's all helping to sell the books. You know, that, I mean, that's a really great marketing tool. And being an author who does not like to do short stories because his mind doesn't want to think about that way, but what Brad says is correct. And 
another industry. They also do, has writers because they, they're screenwriters. But five, another, four, three, another screen, point another five. No. That was just the bomb, folks. That was the bomb. <laughs> yeah, this is a bomb to get us to shut up. No. Um, if you look at various um, television series now, they have webisodes. Yep. That come out. Those are like the proverbial short stories. I'm going to end this on one quick note, and I'm going to go back to something which we were talking about just briefly here with Kathleen's last question. Is um, there are a lot of times in which those who are writers that do this, and we want to make it a business. We have a pay your bill business on the side. We are working for someone else usually, and we've got two full time jobs. And a lot of times, it is hard not to kill your muse. In your writing process, because you're going from proverbially from one chair to another chair, and your loved ones, your family, and that are like, who are you? I don't know you anymore. And personally, to my friends who are still out there that still love me, even though you don't see me for a year or two, <laughs> I love you too. But it, it is you, you guys are used to that with my with my job, both pay bill and writing. And I don't know if there's anybody here who does not have a full time job on top of their writing. Unless you're retired. <laughs> you got three full-time jobs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And with that, thank you, everybody, for listening to Right Pack Radio. You can find us on Twitter, at Right Pack Radio. You can also find us on Facebook. Just look up Right Pack Radio, three words, as well as on Blog Talk Radio. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Right Pack Radio would like to thank STL Books, for allowing us to record in their office. STL Books is an online bookstore specializing in new and used high-quality literature, children's books, and books written by or about St. Louis. Please visit them online at www.stlbooks.com or find their store on the Amazon.com website.